Hey, Pete. Uh, this is Phil in Raleigh, North Carolina. I just wanted to leave you a message uh, with your 500th show coming up. And wanted to let you know that I've been listening to your show on uh, Sirius and for years and years. Love that, but love this new iteration of the show in podcast form. Uh, I got a chance to meet you when you came down with uh, Fugal Sang uh, and company in Durham, North Carolina. Which, uh, I think it was a couple years ago. It was an awesome show. Uh, brought some, brought my wife and some friends, and we loved it. Anyway, congrats, man. The show is a part of my daily routine, as I'm sure others have said. The news recap is uh, fantastic, but more importantly, love your style of interviewing. Love the people that you find to get on the show. I mean, there's just nothing like it. And I listen to a lot of podcasts. I love, you know, all sorts of different things, some sports podcasts, some political Yours is number one. It really is. Yours is the first one that I look at each day and listen to and, and punch up because uh, it really is just kind of a all encompassing podcast. So congrats, man. Um, seriously, it's uh, the work you do is fantastic. I'm a subscriber and uh, again, have been a fan and, and listening to you for years and years and can't wait to listen for years to come. Congrats on 500, my friend. And um, we'll, uh, we'll keep listening. And now, stand up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe. It's time to stand up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as Will my new electric space heater cause a power outage for at least three houses on our block? And with the Build Back Better plan now in peril, will Congress act to overcome political gridlock and also puberty? And now, the podcast host who, with his Uber thrift store dadwear, maintains some serious street fashion credibility, Pete Dominic. Yes, thank you very much, Pete Co. and I appreciate that. It's a kind thing to say about my street credibility trying to maintain. Hello, everybody, and welcome to show 501 of Stand Up with Pete Dominic. It's a daily program, of course, and I'm happy to have you pressing play or downloading. And you're going to love today's show. I've got two great guests joining me, S.E. Cup of CNN and Maura Quint of the Americans for Tax Fairness Campaign, who joins me pretty much every Monday for Maura Monday's Two great guests, awesome conversations with both of them. I think you're really going to love them. And it is Christmas week, everybody. Of course, Christmas is on a Saturday this year, the 25th, the 24th. That would make it would be Christmas Eve. Have you gotten your shopping done? If that's a thing that you're going to do, are you now afraid to go out to the malls? I'm going for it. I'm going to dive in. I'm going to wear my M95. I've got my booster. And I'm not going to be talking to a whole bunch of people, try to stay away from folks, and just pick up a few items that I want to get for a few special people in my life. But I don't blame you if you are concerned, even with all the protections we now have from COVID. And I talk a lot about that with Mara Quinn on today's show. I hope you had a great weekend. It was awesome to see so many of you at Friday Night Hangout, along with Dr. Megan May, who was our special guest, answered our questions on Omicron and life in general. We had a lot of laughs, hung out for a few hours at the Friday Night Hangout. Some of us got a little bit tipsy, and a lot of people were very honest and thoughtful and kind and generous about Show 500 and how far I've come and we've come together, including, and I, I feel so bad for messing with Ben Walter, who was so sweet and who reached out, you know, on, at the Zoom, like 40 people there. And he just, as, as, well, as well as a lot of other people. So I just talked about how much the show has meant to them. And he must have talked for like three minutes. And it was so nice and kind and generous and thoughtful. It made me feel so good. And when he got done, we were all a little emotional because it was so sweet. And then I just said, hey, man, you've been on mute. And he's like, what? And everybody just started laughing because, of course, we heard him. And I, and I told him that. But there was a great hangout, a lot of fun. And thank you, everybody, for your amazing kind words, voicemail messages, emails, polo messages, texts, all of it. I know so many of you in so many different ways and walks in my life. And I am so grateful for your support and feel like the luckiest guy alive. So thank you so much for all of it. 
And as of now, I'm prepared to host a Thursday night Christmas celebration for subscribers. So unless you hear otherwise, let's let's plan for Thursday the 23rd if you want. I don't think I've got anything. And there's nothing I'd rather do than hang out with the people who like and listen and support me and this program where each day we try to learn about the important issues that are affecting us and then also do something about it as well. Just talk about life in general and how we're making it through. And that's why now I want to do just that time to talk about the news from the weekend time for the last 24. All right. Well, the two big stories that were driving the news over the weekend have to be what is being referred to as a fourth wave of coronavirus infections, not only in the U.S., but in other countries as well. And the death, or at least temporarily, of the Build Back Better bill that would have made millions and millions and millions of Americans infinitely better for years and years. But Joe Manchin would not have it, and he became the most trending topic, potentially. Well, certainly in political news, I think, on Sunday. But let's go back and start with the news on COVID. Here's the New York Times. Just days before Christmas, the U.S. is being hit by a fourth wave of coronavirus infections. More than 125,000 Americans on average are testing positive every day as the country confronts the highly contagious Omicron variant. So fun to say and so terrible to have. We might be done with COVID, but COVID is far from done with us. Hospitalizations have increased nearly 20% in two weeks, taxing already exhausted healthcare workers. President Biden set to address the nation on Tuesday. Experts are urging adults to get vaccinated and boosted. Studies indicate that vaccines and especially boosters may offer protection against severe COVID-19, of course, yet among vaccinated Americans, only 30 percent have received a third dose, though some are now questioning that number because it might not have been tracked right by the CDC. The Omicron field spike is swamping the nation's testing capacity as the variant spreads regular home testing can lower risk and ease worry, but those tests are hard to get in some areas. Nations across Europe tightening restrictions to prevent the spread from the Omicron variant. Netherlands became the first European country to announce a full lockdown to fight the variant. France tightening rules for the unvaccinated. London declared a major incident or emergency for the first time since January. Two senators have come up positive coronavirus as well. Senator Elizabeth Warren and Cory Booker from New Jersey and Massachusetts both announcing that they had contracted breakthrough infections, as they call them. Cory Booker, at least I saw his tweet saying he would be so much worse without the vaccine. And that is unfortunately a tough thing to prove to people, even though you have so much data on it. There are some folks at least still aren't buying it because the thinking goes, if you have the vaccine, you still get COVID. Then why get the vaccine? And then you say, because you don't die with the vaccine because it's not nearly as bad with a vaccine is because there's not as many long standing effects with the vaccine. I mean, there's so many benefits of the vaccine, yet it's tough to convince some of our friends and family. I know. All right. That's just some of the details and news stories I read about regarding COVID and COVID news. But let's get to some of the sound from the Sunday shows, starting with Dr. Fauci. He was on several shows. Here he is on State of the Union with Jake Tapper. President Biden said the unvaccinated are, quote, looking at a winter of severe illness and death. Michael Osterholm says a viral blizzard is coming. Where is the pandemic headed right now? Do you expect new record high numbers for cases? And what about hospitalizations and deaths? Well, unfortunately, Jake, I think that that is going to happen. Uh, We are going to see a significant stress in some regions of the country on the hospital system, particularly in those areas where you have a low level of vaccination, which is one of the reasons why we continue to stress the importance of getting those unvaccinated people vaccinated. This virus is extraordinary. It has a doubling time of anywhere from two to three days. Right now, in certain regions of the country, 50 percent of the isolates are Omicron, which means it's going to take over. And if you look at what it's done in South Africa, what it's doing in the UK and what it's starting to do right now, the president is correct. I mean, I was with him when he said that and I spoke to him about that, that we are going to be in for some serious difficulties right now. And we better be doing more to mitigate against that. And it's never too late to get vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated, go get boosted and be prudent in everything else you do. When you travel in your indoor settings that are congregate, 
wear a mask. It is going to be tough. We can't walk away from that, Jake. We can't because with Omicron that we're dealing with, it is going to be a tough few weeks to months as we get deeper into the winter. So here we go again, folks. And how will we survive it this time emotionally? How will we deal with Uh, all of the problems that it creates logistically and financially and for our regular conveniences. I will tell you how with each other. That's how you got to have a a support group. And if you don't have a support group, uh, join our community and we meet every Thursday night and we have a discord platform and people talk and I'll talk and we all talk and we communicate and get exasperated, but also offer solutions and inspirations to each other. That's how I've gotten through it. I've gotten through it with this amazing group and hosting this podcast each and every day. So happy to have you join up with us and reach out to us and connect with people. You have to connect with people with some community somewhere. And if you don't have one, then join us. All right. I wanted to have a little uplifting message there before I head into some more dire analysis. Here is Francis Collins, head of the NIH, on his final day, actually, at the job on ABC News. So we're in for a world of trouble, I'm afraid, in the next month or two. But there are things people can do, and I hope we can talk about that, because this is not one of those situations where we're just helplessly facing the oncoming virus. We have things we can do, and especially those are vaccines and boosters and being careful about masking again. All right, there goes Francis Collins off into the wilderness. Sounds like a very nice guy. Apparently he's very pious, very uh, religious Christian, too. All right, well, different governments have have different leadership and different theories about it. For example, here is the governor of Colorado, Jared Polis. He's been criticized for basically saying he's not going to mess with the masks anymore. He's not going to tell people whether or not they have to wear masks just to get vaccinated, which I think is an error on his part. But here is the Democratic governor on NBC's Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Uh, It looks like from everything that we know that to uh, significantly reduce the risk of the Omicron variant, three doses of the vaccine are needed. And by the way, Chuck, this is normal with many other vaccines. I have young kids. They have the DTaP vaccine. Every kid gets it, diphtheria, tetanus. It's three uh, doses of that vaccine to be effective. So I wish they'd stop talking about it as a booster, Chuck. It really is a three-dose yeah. vaccine. And every piece of data that we're seeing uh, cl- uh, shows that that's the case. Well, the other big thing is testing, of course. Everybody's talking about testing and how they're sometimes in some places hard to get and that they're too expensive for a lot of people. And as long as someone can't afford to take a test, then that's just another way for that person to spread it. Well, here's more from Jared Polis, who says they made free at-home testing available to every Coloradoan for months now. We've uh, made free at-home testing available to every Coloradan for months now. So- hey, that's exactly what I said he was going to say. Now, So we've sent out over 1.2 million just right to your doorstep to get the free test, the same kind that in other states people have to buy. It's a popular program. Uh, we're certainly planning on continuing it uh, for the time being. It's also important to note that while the Northeast is going up now in cases, our region in the Rocky Mountain West has actually been going down for several weeks. We uh, peaked in October, early November. All right, so that's Jared Polis on Meet the Press yesterday. And now here, he's a governor of Colorado, of course, Democrat. And now here, let's go down to Florida, where where Ron DeSantis is constantly failing or succeeding, depending on how you look at it. But anyway, he was on, I I think this has got to be a failure from anybody's point of view. He was on Fox Business yesterday with that awful Maria Bartiromo. And she asked him a question that I, I don't think he was prepared to answer. And well, listen. Governor, we're not even sure what fully vaccinated means anymore. The other day, Dr. Fauci said, you know, we could be that uh, fully vaccinated means three shots, which is two shots for the vaccination and then one booster shot. Have you gotten the booster? So uh, I've done whatever I did, the, the normal shot. And, you know, that at the end of the day is people's individual decisions about what they want to do. But these boosters in terms of now, Florida, we don't we ban vaccine passports. We, we won't let them fire you, even private businesses over this, because we don't think that's appropriate. Oh, man. Wow. Did you hear that? He really was not expecting that, didn't know how to answer. And it's really sad if it wasn't so awful, then you'd want to laugh at it. But if you're a leader and you don't lead by example and you say, listen, I got the shot, you should, too. That's a pretty easy thing to say and do then you're responsible for people getting sick and dying. Have you gotten the booster? 
So uh, I, I've done whatever I did, the, the normal shot. The normal shot. He got the normal shot and then whatever, the other things and stuff with the uh, some of the other shots. I mean, I got my one, I got two, I don't know, I might have gotten another shot. I, get, I don't remember even if I got any shots or if I told anybody. Someone please save me from myself. All right, one more piece of sound for you on COVID. This is Dr. Scott Gottlieb of Pfizer, former FDA chief. With news for parents, he told CBS Margaret Brennan that he predicts the majority of schools will return in person next year after this Christmas break. Quickly, should parents expect to send their kids back to in-person school after Christmas? I think in most places of the country, the answer is yes. In some hard hits parts of the country where there's a high um, prevalence of Delta right now, high flu prevalence like the Northeast, the Great Lakes region, and now Omicron later on top of that, where healthcare systems could get pressed. I think that you could see some districts make decisions to extend the breaks. All right. Well, we're heading into the darkest time of the year on the 21st, shortest day of the year this week. And it's obviously metaphorically or literally, I suppose, that way, if you look at death as being dark or illness. And so be careful out there. Let's support each other. Be safe. Get your booster. Wear a mask and and be patient. Be patient with people who are concerned about being ill and getting sick especially and support those who are working on the front lines however we can and whatever other great ideas that you've got now i did appear on msnbc on friday night jason johnson was in hosting for ari melber asked me to join him to talk about some of the work that i and others in my community have been doing to fight back against those in our community who want to get rid of diversity equity and inclusion programming and Go backwards, in our opinion. So here's two minutes of our chat from Friday night on MSNBC that I think I, I got to say, I think I nailed this one. Pete, you know, one of the other things that we've seen this week, and, 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 you know, I don't think there's any hero in this story. You've got the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, who's passing this sort of anti-woke act. He's trying to stop critical race theory. One of the things that I think has been overlooked in all these discussions about critical race theory is the local heroes, the parents white, black, Asian, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whatever, who have fought back against this nonsense on a local level. You've had some real fights in your local community about critical race theory and what's happening at your schools. I'm making you a hero for a day. Tell us some of the the challenges that you face in your community and how you've tried to fight back against some of the racist nonsense. Well, the challenges are that we don't we just don't have enough people standing up. I mean, they 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 want to be on the right side of history and they might support us, but they don't necessarily show up. They don't organize. We got a good group of people, over 150 people in our town, but we need more people. You know, earlier you mentioned the the quote that that Ron DeSantis the other day with his bat stop woke act, you know, is mentioning everybody's always talking about Dr. King's content of the character, not the color of their skin. But, you know, Dr. King also talked about the the white moderate. That's a quote we don't hear enough about. The first time I heard that, I realized, oh, he's talking about me. He once said, I've been greatly disappointed with the white moderate who is more devoted to order than justice. And Jason, if you just wouldn't mind moving out of the way so I can talk to white folks, uh, we need you. We need you to show up. (laughs) There's a group organizing right now in your town. Get on board. Be, you got to be the change you want to see in the world. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. If you're not doing anything, now is the time, white folks, to stand up and do something and get organized. I mean, Ron DeSantis pass, is trying to pass something called the Stop Woke Act. They're trying to get wit- rid of language. That's the other challenge, Jason. They're really, I mean, authoritarian history, historians have been talking about this. They're trying to get rid of the word equity. Yesterday, he was also at the end of it, he started throwing out white hoods. I mean, white hats. I mean, it's really... <laughs> Really, so much propaganda. And even in my town, when they say things like, when you hear diversity and equity and inclusion, that they mean CRT. So they're really co-opting language. And we've got to be there. We've got to show up. We've got to organize. Or they are going to turn our schools into Jesus camps with AR-15s. Boom. Landed it. The plane, I mean. That was like a two-minute rant by me on MSNBC on Friday night. I don't think I've ever... Rarely gone that long, but I'm clearly fired up about this issue, and hopefully you are joining your local community organization that is working to fight for diversity, equity, and inclusion programming in your school, which benefits not only minority kids, but the white kids, of course. Learning about diversity of culture, diversity of developmental and learning disabilities, and trying to create more equity of opportunity in the schools. And just learning about each other. I mean, it's 
didn't seem like it was that controversial when I was growing up. Maybe I wasn't paying as much attention when my mom was a middle school teacher teaching inclusion to learning disabled kids and a wide group of students doing also continuing education as a teacher with her master's degree, learning about cultural differences because she did have half of about almost half of the student body there were black kids. And so she needed to learn as a white person growing up in the country, some of the cultural differences to be a more effective teacher. It's great. And it's led by people who know what they're talking about. It does not have to be controversial. It can make the social fabric of your community stronger. Rant over. Of course, the other huge story over the weekend, Sunday morning breaking that Senator Joe Manchin announced on Fox News. He effectively killed President Biden's signature domestic policy bill in its current form, saying it would exacerbate inflation and a whole bunch of other bullshit. Economic evidence strongly suggests otherwise, of course, and some Democrats believe there's still a chance to recast the bill to suit Mr. Manchin's demands. But, oh, the hot takes were hard and fast on social media, on TV and everywhere else. Ari Berman tweets, Joe Manchin represents 0.5% of U.S. population, but he's killing Build Back Better, supported by 70% of Americans. Rob Reiner, I don't remember marking my presidential ballot for Joe Manchin. He's single-handedly denying Americans environmental protection, pre-K, child care, affordable prescription drugs. If he kills voting rights, he will deny U.S. democracy. West Virginia ranks 50th in child care, 50th in public health, 45th in education, 50th in infrastructure and 48th in employment. And Joe Manchin can't vote yes on Build Back Better bill because inflation. That's Heather Gardner. Miley Jong Fast. West Virginia is the second poorest state in the country. So it makes sense that their senator wouldn't support things that help working people. My God, Joe Manchin, who owns you? Noel Kassler says Joe Manchin's job wasn't just to kill bills. It was to waste six months and help run out the legislative clock, so to speak. So the GOP and MAGA could build up munitions for the coming culture war. It's no accident that Trump has held rallies this whole time while Coke and Exxon play for keeps. And Jim Acosta tweets, Goldman Sachs cut U.S. economic forecast after Joe Manchin rejects Build Back Better. So many different takes. Let me play a couple things for you from Democrats and critics of Joe Manchin's that were on the shows on Sunday. Here is Congresswoman Elon Omar. She was on MSNBC with my good friend Ali Velshi. We, we all knew that uh, Senator Manchin couldn't be trusted. Um, you know, the the excuses that he just made, um, I think, are complete bullshit. Um, it is really disheartening uh, to hear him say that he has been trying to get there for the people of West Virginia, um, uh, because that's a complete lie. The people of West Virginia uh, would greatly benefit um, from their families having access to you know, long term elderly care. Uh, and care for um, folks with disabilities. They would uh, benefit from the uh, expansion of the child tax credits. Uh, they will benefit from having access to um, pre-K. Uh, there are just so many things that you know, the people of West Virginia desperately need. Uh, and we know that he is not um, working on uh, behalf of their interest. And uh, I really am uh, just completely disappointed and disgusted by his reasoning. All right. Meanwhile, over on CNN, Jay Tapper had Ayanna uh, Presley, Congresswoman Presley on, and she wasn't falling for his gotcha question. But do you think President Biden broke his promise? He said, I give you my word as a Biden, we're going to get all 50 Democrats on board. This is about Joe Manchin obstructing the president's agenda, obstructing the people's agenda, torpedoing our opportunity to advance unprecedented advancements to address the hurt that this pandemic induced recession has caused and to get this pandemic under control. I also like Congresswoman Presley's answer here. Again, this is from State of the Union on CNN about Joe Manchin. My lack and deficit of trust was about Senator Manchin. Uh, he has continued to move the goalpost. He has never negotiated in good faith. And he is obstructing the president's agenda, 85% of which is still left on the table. And in obstructing the president's agenda, he is obstructing the people's agenda. Um, I was listening to his interview earlier today, and he said it's a mammoth bill. You're right. It's a mammoth bill to address mammoth hurt. You know, to lower the cost of elder care, child care. And so much more like saving the planet. 
And I think you got to hear Senator Bernie Sanders. He was really pissed off and on CNN. At least that's how I thought. He also doesn't seem like he's giving up. Like he doesn't know how. I like the guy no matter what. I think he's made mistakes, but I am so thankful that he's been out there beating this same drum for so long because it's so important and such effective messaging to do it this way. And he, unlike Joe Manchin, is not bought and paid for. And you know what? I'm going to give you like the whole six minutes here of this back and forth between Jay Tapper and Bernie Sanders on CNN State of the Union yesterday. Because I heard it twice and thought it was good both times. Breaking news this morning, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia has just said he is a no on President Biden's cornerstone legislation, Build Back Better. Take a listen. I cannot vote to continue with this piece of legislation. I just can't. I've tried everything humanly possible. I can't get there. You're done. This is this is a no. This is a no. On this legislation, I have tried everything I know to do. Joining us now exclusively to react, the man managing the legislation, Senate Budget Committee Chairman Bernie Sanders of Vermont. Um, So, Senator Sanders, Chairman Sanders, Senator Manchin says he can't get there. This is a no. He's tried everything. What's your reaction? Well, I think he's going to have a lot of explaining to do to the people of West Virginia to tell them why he doesn't have the guts to take on the drug companies and lower the cost of prescription drugs why he is not prepared to expand home health care. West Virginia is one of the poorest states in this country. You got elderly people and disabled people who would like to stay at home or forced into nursing homes. He's going to have to tell the people of West Virginia why he doesn't want to expand Medicare to cover dental, hearing, and eyeglasses. I, I've been to West Virginia a number of times, and it's a great state, beautiful people. But it is a state that is struggling. And he's going to have to tell the people of West Virginia why he's rejecting what the scientists of the world are telling us, that we have to act boldly and transform our energy system to protect future generations from the devastation of climate change. You know, what's going on now, Jake, in Washington is the big money interests are pouring hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that we continue to pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs that the rich do not stop paying their fair share of taxes. And I would have hoped that we could have had at least 50 Democrats on board who have the guts to stand up for working families and take on the lobbyists and the powerful special interests. We have no Republican support. Not one Republican in the United States Senate or the House, for that matter, is prepared to the drug companies or the insurance companies or the wealthy. I would hope we would have had 50 Democrats. Mm -hmm. But if that is the case, then I hope that we will bring a strong bill to the floor of the Senate as soon as we can And let Mr. Manchin explain to the people of West Virginia why he doesn't have the guts to stand up to powerful special interests. So you want to vote on it no matter what, even even if. Absolutely. Absolutely. The American people have got to understand what is at stake for decades now. What Congress has been doing, giving tax breaks to the rich, not standing up to the drug companies so that we end up paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, ignoring climate change. The president of the United States. And Mm -hmm. almost every Democrat is trying, finally, to address these issues. Did you know this was coming? Mr. Manchin doesn't want to support us. Well, look, we've been dealing with Mr. Manchin for month after month after month. But if he doesn't have the courage to do the right thing for the working families of West Virginia and America, let him vote no in front of the whole world. So how do you tell somebody out there watching, wondering, how come you couldn't get Joe Manchin on board? Well, as I've indicated. We're taking on not just Joe Manchin, we're taking on, do you know how much money the pharmaceutical industry has spent in the last year on lobbying alone? Over $300 million, plus campaign contributions, plus all kinds of advertising. Fossil fuel industry is spending a fortune. Let's not kid ourselves. We got a corrupt, we have a corrupt political system dominated by big money interests. And finally, some of us are saying, let's stand up. For working families, average worker has not seen a pay raise in inflation accounted for dollars in 45 years, while the rich are becoming phenomenally richer. Corporate profits are at an all-time high. And what some of us are saying, maybe, maybe, we'll stand up for working families for a change. But apparently, we don't have the 50 votes that we need. And I think we take that message right into the 2022 campaigns, which party, with the exception maybe of one or two people, 
which party is prepared to do the right things for the elderly, for the children. And by the way, we talk about kids. I want everybody out there to know if this mansion votes, though, those three hundred dollar tax credits that have gone a long way to reducing childhood poverty in America, they're gone. Mm -hmm. That's over. We cut childhood poverty by over 40 percent. An extraordinary accomplishment. Manchin doesn't want to do that. Tell that to the struggling families of West Virginia and America. So he's you're you're suggesting he doesn't have the guts to stand up for working families and to take on uh, the moneyed interests. If Senator Manchin were here, he would say my state is a state that voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. What I'm doing and going after and opposing this legislation will be popular. And Manchin has said he thinks no, all uh, all this no. money, he, he's saying all this money look, is going to is going to make, make inflation worse. Uh, look, I t well, let me talk about it. Joe Manchin voted for a huge increase in military spending. Manchin voted for an infrastructure bill, which added two hundred and fifty billion dollars to the deficit. The truth of the matter is that if you look at the military budget, seven hundred and seventy billion Times that by 10 years, it is four times higher than what the Build Back Better plan is. Now, you know, Mr. Manchin says he's representing the people of West Virginia. OK, why don't you do a poll? It's CNN do a poll. And you ask the people of West Virginia whether or not they want to lower the cost of prescription drugs. You ask them whether they want to expand Medicare to cover dental, hearing and eyeglasses. You ask them whether they want to continue the $300 payment to help working parents in these very difficult times, bring up their kids with dignity. Ask them if they want to deal with climate change. Mm -hmm. On all of those issues, I suspect people of West Virginia, like every other state in this country, will say, yes, do the right thing for working families. Is there a and I challenge. You know, I told Manchin, by the way, I'll pay for the damn poll in West Virginia on those issues. See how the people of West Virginia feel. All right. Well, I think we're going to hear a lot more about that this week. And uh, I think the Senate, though, has checked out for the year. So. We'll see what happens with it. Uh, David K. Johnston was on MSNBC over the weekend. I just want to play this one last clip for you. He said Trump is about to be indicted in New York for racketeering. And I want to play this longer clip for you as well. We'll see and hold David K. Johnston to what he's saying here. I want to read for you some of which was offered up during this Forbes testimony. That Trump told me that I look better if I'm worth 10 billion than if I'm worth 4 billion, as reported in the article. More specifically, that Trump told me that a higher net worth number was, quote unquote, good for financing. Also, that as reported, Trump said that during the early 1990s, Forbes estimate were actually high, as Trump put it, and he deserved to be off the list. What could this mean, uh, David, for Cy Vance's case? Well, I, I anticipate they're going to bring a racketeering charge against Trump, New York State racketeering charge. And uh, it's one thing to assert to local property tax officials or a banker you're trying to get a loan from that your uh, worth is, let's say, a uh, hundred million dollars. But if you claim it's a billion dollars, that's fraud. Um, valuations matter. And in Trump's case, we know that he has, uh, for example, argued that his golf course in Westchester County, New York, is worth uh, $1.4 million. But right. on his presidential form, he says $50 million, And in interviews, he says more than $100 million. Well, those numbers aren't reconcilable. And so what they're doing is showing that Trump knowingly, deliberately, with malice aforethought, and intent to deceive was manipulating the system. And when you take out a mortgage loan in particular, you usually sign under penalty of perjury. Glenn Kirshner tweeted, somebody is scared to death. Buckle up, buttercup. It's about to come crashing down. Justice is coming. Well, we'll see if those guys who have been predicting these things for a while are going to be proven right in any way, shape or form. I certainly hope they are. All right, that is all the sound I've got for you in today's last 24. But there are a few more headlines I like to share, things I've gathered throughout the day that you've sent me, tweeted to me, or somehow told me about rapid-fire headlines. It's the news dump. Pete Co. with another original jingle. Rabbitous squirrels and rodents eat enlarging many rumps, eat themselves into oblivion onto today's news dump.
Oh, my Lord. I don't know what that was. I don't know if I want to know what that was, but it was entertaining as always. Thank you, Pete Coe. Great to see you on Friday night as well. All right. Let me lead with the California cannabis industry. Companies there warning the governor that the state's legal industry was on the verge of collapse and that they have to have immediate tax cuts and a rapid expansion of retail outlets to steady what they're calling a very shaky marketplace. A letter signed by more than two dozen Cannabis company executives, industry officials, and legalization advocates followed years of complaints that the heavily taxed and regulated industry was unable to compete with the the widespread illegal economy where consumer prices are far lower and sales are double or triple the legal business. Why buy marijuana from a store and pay a huge amount of taxes when you can get it from Carl? who lives next door and grows it in his attic or whatever. Interesting story and problem. Also, I think the other issue is that California growers are not allowed to sell to other states. So the market is limited because it's not a free market across state lines. 23 people were injured in Mexico when a cable pedestrian bridge collapsed. Officials in southern Mexico say a pedestrian suspension bridge bridge has collapsed, dumping a group heading to a Christmas party into a ravine and sending 23 people to the hospital. So they're injured but not dead. So that's not a horrible, horrible story. Injured included both children and adults, but apparently everybody survived. They didn't survive in the Philippines, where the death toll in the strongest typhoon to batter the Philippines this year has reached at least 146. The governor of an island province, especially hard hit by Typhoon Rai, RAI, said there may be even greater devastation that is yet to be reported. Horrible situation in the Philippines. And apparently, like, more than 40 passengers aboard a Royal Caribbean cruise ship have tested positive for coronavirus. And, uh, yeah, the cruise line confirmed that 44 out of 6,074 passengers and crew tested positive for COVID-19 on the cruise, which ended in Miami on Saturday. Who are you people going on cruises? Who's going on a cruise? I want to talk to somebody on a cruise. Find me somebody on a cruise. I want them on the show. Let's do this. Give them the hotline. 209, stand up. Call me if you know anybody on a cruise. Or call me from a cruise. Even better. Now, the Pope said nice things on Sunday that I wanted to mention. He said that acts of violence against women are almost satanic, he said. He was kind of having a conversation with a woman who fled her abusive husband, and he said the number of women who are beaten and abused in their homes, even by their husbands, very, very high. Problem is that for me, he said, it's almost satanic because it's taking advantage of a person who cannot defend herself, who can only try to block the blows. It is humiliating, very humiliating, he added. I see dignity in you. He was talking to this, this woman who's a survivor. He said, if you didn't have dignity, you wouldn't be here, though. So, I thought that was an interesting story. I'm glad that he is talking about and uh, trying to educate people and prevent domestic abuse, leader of the Catholic Church. And a staff member from a D.C. public school is now on leave after reportedly making third graders participate in a Holocaust reenactment. The Washington Post reported that a uh, elementary school staff member had students pretend to dig their classmates' mass graves and act out shooting the victims. Additionally, there were allegations of a staff member using hate speech during the lesson, which is unacceptable and not tolerated by uh, the schools, uh, according to a a spokesperson. Yikes. Not approved, obviously. Not an approved lesson plan. So, in case anybody wants to go scream at the Board of Education, not all teachers are perfect. They make mistakes there. We should be able to criticize them, especially when they do bad things like that. But unless you walk a day in their shoes and reach out and try to get to the truth, don't go crazy posting stuff on Facebook. Uh, The Senate has confirmed 40 judges during Biden's first year in office, the most since Ronald Reagan was president. I thought that was a pretty good achievement for Senate Democrats. Chile, the country of Chile, has elected a, a young man, a millennial, who wants to tax the rich as the new president. A leftist millennial, his name is Gabriel Boric, previously led an anti-government student protest, won Chile's presidential election on Sunday, is set to become the country's youngest leader, 35 years old. He won 56%, while his opponent won 44%. And he said, I'm going to be the president of all Chileans. Well, good luck, Gabriel Boric. If you figure out how to tax the rich, please let us know. And finally... Never underestimate the amazing Spider-Man. Even with COVID, coronavirus mutating, despite rising concerns, the variant, 
My daughter and I contributed to the box office, which shattered pandemic era box office records, becoming the third best opening film of all time behind Avengers and Endgame and Avengers Infinity War, which I also saw with Ava and interviewed the brothers who directed them. But Sony and Marvel blockbuster Spider-Man No Way Home made a stunning $253 million in ticket sales from 4,325 North American locations, according to the Associated Press and studio estimates that were reported on Sunday. All right, and I think that's a story that is good to end with. That is today's news dump, and I've got two excellent guests joining me coming up. It's Moral Mondays. Always great, a conversation, deep and personal, also talking as well about quotes that motivate us and what Joe Manchin means for this country and a lot more. And then also before that, Essie Cup of CNN joined me. We had a great conversation about several different topics as well. She cleared up for us why she has a giant picture of Al Gore in her home and uh, also came out as a lesbian. Yep. Yep, you'll have to hear it. You'll have to hear it. But before that, you've got to hear about this. It's GiveWell.org. I've got to tell you about GiveWell.org, an amazing organization that I am so happy to be partnering with. It is Christmas week, and I hope that you will consider a donation to an organization that practices a philosophy called effective altruism. Look it up. Look into it. Watch Peter Singer's TED Talks and understand this philosophy that GiveWell works with, which is to try to prevent the worst kind of suffering and death by making your donation to a nonprofit go the furthest. They use research, they vet out these organizations, and they let you know where you should be donating. They spend over 20,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only recommend a few of the highest impact evidence-backed charities they've found. Over 50,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $750 million. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save tens of thousands of lives and improve the lives of millions of more. And GiveWell is free. GiveWell wants to empower as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about their donations. They publish all their research and recommendations on their site for free, no sign-up required. They allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity that you choose without taking a cut, and that is why I support them. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $250 before the end of the year or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org slash stand up right now or pick pad- podcast and enter stand up with Pete Dominic at checkout. Make sure they know you heard about GiveWell from Stand Up. Go to GiveWell.org slash stand up to have your donation matched right now. Bed nets to prevent malaria, preventative medication for malaria, vitamin A supplements, and so much more. The Boston Globe calls GiveWell the gold standard for giving. Go to GiveWell.org slash stand up right now. Save lives, support this program, learn and work together to make lives better. It's Christmas week and it's time to donate to GiveWell.org. Thanks, guys. Okay, now it's time to get to my first guest on today's show. Very happy to have Essie Cup whenever she joins me. We always have a great conversation. And last week, comedian J.L. Covan uh, reached out to me and sent me a screen grab because Essie was on CNN. And he said, you got to ask her about this picture. There's a picture of Al Gore in the background of her live shot when she's uh, on CNN doing commentary from home. And it was bizarre. And so I started a thing with her on Twitter about it. And then I opened my conversation asking her about it. And she clears that up, which is great. But, of course, I should just mention that Essie Cup is a Daily News columnist. She is a commentator and anchor at CNN. She's worked at all of the major networks and at the major newspapers, including the New York Times, which she refers to in the explanation about the Al Gore picture. And I've known her for years. We go way back, which is why I didn't feel too embarrassed that... When I was waiting for her at the video link up and she showed up and I looked up at my camera and realized that a pen, a black ink pen had blown up in my mouth and was all over my mouth, my, my, my lips, my teeth, my mustache. It was horrible. And I decided to leave that audio in there because it was, while embarrassing (laughs) a little bit, uh, hilarious. And you get to hear a little bit of the, the back and forth when that happens. Ladies and gentlemen, on Twitter, at S-E-Cup, here we go. Hey! 
Hello. Oh my God. <gasps> he. Oh my God. A pen exploded in my mouth. Yes, it did. Holy majoli. Oh my God. Before I talked to you and it's stained. It's even stained my tooth. Yes. I see it. Do you want to go try to clean up and come back? I think I'm getting it. That is hilarious. You didn't feel it or taste it? No, I just wanted, I was just waiting for you to be embarrassed. No, it happens. Yeah. It looks like, um, like a, like a movie effect. Let's see which pen. There it is. There that it is. is. That's better. That's better. <laughs> What's the worst thing that's ever? I've gone on TV with lipstick on my teeth. It makes you look crazy. It has the unintended effect of making you look like a crazy old lady. Yeah, well. Now makes, I'm very self-conscious about this it. This makes me look like a murderer. No, it makes you look like a, like Pee Wee Herman. Like a like a joker okay okay well i have got her now she is one of my favorite people to talk to on the podcast and she's joined me many times in the last two years and then before uh, a long history with se cup and we're very happy to have you thank you for joining me again always thank you for having me lots of really important and serious issues to talk about but we do have to get this uh kind of elephant literally in the room out of the way you were on tv on cnn Last week, and and I don't know if this is the first time, but a lot of people were reacting about a, a photograph in your home. You're in your home uh, broadcasting, and and it's on the wall, and you're you're showing us now for people who are is watching. <laughs> what, um, it seems to be a, a photo of. It's very big. It is. I'll show you to scale. Like it's a little far away for me, but um, yeah. It, it, like this is my hand on it. Okay. It, it is. It's probably. Four feet by five feet. I mean, it's it's massive. So it seems to be a photograph of, of Al Gore and, and two other young people uh, <laughs> playing outside is the best way to describe it. And okay. there's what's the, your question? I mean, and <laughs> that's not weird. It's the weirdest thing in the world for any <laughs> it, it's it's it, it would be weird for Al Gore to have that. up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not a great picture. It's an action photo of like somebody playing outside and it's huge and it's on your wall. And I demand and the public demands that you explain this mysterious. Have you explained this ever before? I have to people who have asked. I don't think I've done so publicly, Oops, um, but come on. it's funny. Like, you know, Room Raider. Yes. The, um, yes. They've asked me about it. They haven't. And, and I told them what it was about. They didn't publish that uh which is fine so i'm and getting the exclusive i didn't know it was an exclusive they he did like dm'd me he's like what is that about i told him and apparently like he's he's holding on to it which is very nice no i'm saying i'm saying i'm getting the exclusive i'm putting this out america this is the most important thing in the country right now We're everybody's talking about it other colleagues have like texted me like what why is al gore behind you i freely tell the story i feel like i don't know if we're building it up the story's not that good, but there's a definite story. This isn't on my wall, like, randomly. So here's the story. Uh, this picture, there's two parts. The first part of this story is this picture is from 2000. It is a couple days after the November presidential election. As you remember, the votes were still being counted and recounted. We did not have a president just because election day was over. Al Gore's camp told him to go outside his front lawn of the vice president's house with his kids and play flag football so as to appear confident. And of course, all anyone talked about when this picture finally came out in the New York Times was how staged it all looked. That is part one of the story. Part two of the story, I am working at the New York Times. And in the eight years following 2000 and pictures like this that were newsy and in some cases um, Pulitzer winning are ha hang all over the old the old New York Times building. When we are planning to leave the New York Times building into the new building, which is the big the big building on on 8th and Broadway now. They say to employees, take a picture, you can have one of these to take home. And someone, you know, someone from my department took a big A-Rod picture because they wanted, you know, a A-Rod Yankees moment picture or whatever. And some other obviously big moments were taken. I took this 
Because to me, it is a constant reminder that authenticity goes a long way in politics and in life. And I spent eight years looking at this picture, thinking about that. And so it, it means something to me outside of what it depicts. And so that's why it's there. That's the story. Uh, Are you disappointed? No, I'm, 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 I'm angry. (laughs) Why? Because I've thought about it so much. And if it's, it's a great reason. I love what you just said, authenticity. But why not put it, why do we have to see it? <laughs> and we don't know that that's what it means. And we're left, I, do you know how that's much time, boring. how much time I spent like guessing and speculating? Most of us settled on the conspiracy that one of the people in the photo was someone that you knew uh, and knew it wasn't your kid because it was, you know, he's too old even now to be, but, but um, a lot of questions were asked and I just... I appreciate you clearing it up, but I wish um, wish I hadn't spent <laughs> I get so much this out of you. Huh? <laughs> you wish I'd get this out of you. <laughs> you know what I wish? I think that you should do me me personally a favor. I would like you to put up a photo of me over your shoulder, which is you can give it whatever you know definition of reminder that you want, but it'll raise questions. It'll help promote my podcast. Okay. Uh, so why is there a bald guy? with ink on his face just before I hit uh, record uh, a pen blew up on my face and I didn't know it. And then SC was like, I think you're bleeding black (laughs) anyway. Well, let's jump, jump out of that into, I think it's a good segue. Actually, the idea of authenticity you you've been talking a lot about, and you wrote a great piece over at the New York daily news, where of course you're a columnist about kind of an, uh, an issue of authenticity and that is about these text messages that were sent to the former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, by several different people who were saying one thing privately and another thing publicly. You've been you've been all over this issue. And I, I feel like that's exactly what you're talking about in terms of authenticity and why it matters. What, what, how big? Why is this such a big issue to you? Why are you talking so much about this story? I mean, I, I agree with it. I just want to know your take. Well, as always, thanks for reading my work. I really do appreciate that. Um, I think you and I, I mean, authenticity comes up for me all the time in my business and life and politics. And I think you and I talked about this. Yeah. You were even, no, I know I text, I tweeted about it. I said a long time ago, a producer friend of mine told me morning show producer said, the audience will always figure you out. And if you're pretending to be someone you're not, they will expose you and they won't forgive you. And he said this about another famous morning show anchor. And I think you tried to guess who and you did not get it. But um, yeah, I still don't know who that was. And this morning show anchor was one way on television and another way in life. And he the producer said to me, you can be an, an asshole on TV as long as you're an asshole in real life. Right. If there's this dichotomy and you're found out, they'll never trust you again. Right. And so whether it's that milieu or talking about the people you and I know at Fox, who I know know better, who say one thing to me privately and another thing publicly. And what these text messages to Mark Meadows revealed was that Sean and Laura and Brian and Don Jr., say one thing privately and a different thing publicly. And not only is that kind of inauthenticity gross and a lie, it's a sh- it's a sh- charade. It's super, super dangerous when you're talking about stuff like, I don't know, COVID or a democratic election. When you're using kind of a performance and you're putting on a character to talk to people who want that character, but you're dressing it as news. Well, I think that's pretty, pretty much the worst thing you could do with a platform. I I agree, but it would seem that the person who argued or gave you that piece of advice, who might've been a hypocrite himself, isn't necessarily, it's not necessarily accurate given what we've seen now, because we have seen a duplicitousness. It's, we've got the text messages and maybe people haven't heard the juxtaposition between the two. Maybe they only heard one side of it and obviously most likely the public side. Uh, but then you've got a situation like I think it was Alex Jones 
but it might have been Hannity, too, where they were sued or someone else. And they said, you know, in the lawsuit, how could anybody ever be taking me seriously? I'm an entertainer. And and they got away with it. But people are taking them seriously. And my point, as he is, even though they're it's found out now that they're saying something privately, differently, publicly, it doesn't seem to be deteriorating no. their integrity or their reputation with their fans and viewers. Do you? Agree or disagree? You're somewhere in between. Are they? No, I'm complete, I completely agree mm. because what my producer was talking about from 40 years ago, 40 years ago, I mean, television audiences, America has changed. And I think especially in, in this way that we're talking about, audiences aren't craving authenticity. They're craving affirmation. Yeah. And they want someone who's going to affirm what they already believe or stoke their own inner grievances and fears and loathing. And whether they meet it or not almost doesn't matter. I mean, as you pointed out, it was Tucker's show where Fox's own lawyers said in defense of him, people do not take Tucker Carlson's show and what he says as fact. They take it as entertainment. A U.S. district judge agreed with with that statement. So there is almost an expectation. And we had it with Donald Trump. We have that expectation. He doesn't really believe all this. Who knows? He's saying it to get elected. It's a put on. It's a character. It's a character. I mean, I think he believed a lot of what he did and said. But I also think like flipping from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party he kind of went wherever he saw an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Americans have become have started accepting that. And so you're right. I don't think you're going to see this flight from Fox News hosts. I've seen it a little. Um, I have people, friends in my family who used to watch religiously and can't anymore. It's too over the top. It's too mm. doom and gloom. They know they don't believe it. And um, they've shut it. They've shut it all off. But they then didn't there's a, else. They but, just shut it all off. But then there's. Who knows what the percentages are, how many. But then there's, you know, a certain percentage that Fox News hasn't been extreme enough. And as Trump and others have been critical of it, um, push them over to other networks. Max and OAN, right. And, you know, even worse, if it's possible, YouTube and, you know, just even Joe Rogan now is so far out there on on everything. Like people just need it, need to go even further because Fox isn't far enough. By the way. Did you hear Tucker Carlson last week? I haven't heard a lot of people talk about this. He said that Alex Jones is a better journalist, more of a journalist than CBS News, Margaret Brennan and some other corporate media person. I forget who it was. And then the week later, I heard that Alex Jones said the the horrible tornadoes in Kentucky were potentially a Joe Biden weather weapon. Well, it's not a serious statement to say that Alex Jones is a journalist, period, let alone a serious one. Um, and forget comparing him to any, any actual journalist. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's what Tucker's become. He, he's become kind of a troll dressed in newsman's clothing. And as, as much as we know not to take that seriously, because Fox's lawyers have told us not to take that seriously. I mean, that's, that's how, that's how unserious it is. Uh, certainly plenty of people do take that seriously and it gets them angry. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It gets them angry enough to storm the Capitol. It gets them angry enough to not wear masks and go ahead and die of COVID. It gets them angry enough to hate their neighbors um, and call the police on black and brown people. It gets them angry enough to do terrible things. And if you want to pretend you have nothing to do with that or your hands are clean because you didn't go out and tell them to do that, uh, well, that's a lie. That's a fallacy. And I don't know how people sleep at night knowing that that's going on. <laughs> Probably fine on a bed of money. Yeah. Oh, just fine. Just uh, fine. But 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 I think you left out a word. Exactly. It makes them afraid and then angry. Like they're afraid of so many things that aren't happening. Yes. It's so sad. Uh, also, the January 6th commission, you know, with these sex messages this week and one of the other points being brought up is how a lot of these Republican congressmen like Jim Jordan, they were all over the Benghazi issue, uh, which is, you know, four people. By the way, you know, it, it, at worst, I don't remember the truth about it, but at worst, Hillary Clinton, they're saying at worst, I think they're accusing her of saying stand down. 
uh, which is far worse than what we saw. Uh, I mean, Trump basically took no action, inaction, right, on, on January 6th. But regardless, those comparisons, do you think, my, my question to you is, do you think this commission will come up with anything? Because if they don't, then it just, I think, deteriorates credibility with Congress and congressional committees similar to this, including, you know, unfortunately what happened with the impeachments, the credibility, I think they lose credibility and it looks like a stunt. What do you think? Yeah. Well, listen, I I remember Benghazi well, and Benghazi was important. Benghazi was bad. And what the administration did, not just Hillary, but Susan Rice and and Obama himself, um, blaming a false videotape um, at first, they, they did some pretty, I'll be generous and say inept things because I don't think they they meant to be duplicitous in the beginning. They were certainly incompetent. And then later they were duplicitous. Um, But I would be an idiot not to say that Republicans also made a performance of that investigation for years and years and years. An investigation I thought started out as very important and serious. Now, and Hillary Clinton came and testified for 11 hours, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Yes. And that was absolutely a tragedy and should never happen again. And so I would say now getting to the bottom of that was important. I think this investigation is as important, if not more important, because future elections are at stake. And we know far too little about what happened in the White House during those hours. And I'm hopeful that during the course of this investigation, we'll get some of those answers. Whether it leads to criminal prosecutions or not, I can't, I don't know. But I think it's important to have an official accounting of history. And when you have people in the Republican Party from Trump on down lying about the events of that day, well, it'd be great if we could have an official kind of accounting of what happened in a more complete way. I always thought maybe Don Jr. was somehow more involved, and maybe he is, but I feel like His text messages saying, stop this, this is bad, kind of point to the fact that he wasn't in charge of the Secret Service trying to, you know, whisk Mike Pence away so they couldn't sort of, there was no, like, I mean, you would really have to be stupid to bring him in on anything, period, at all, uh, outside of opening a new used car lot, and even then he'll show up at the wrong dealership, but I, I mean, I feel like he's almost vindicated on being implicated in any kind of larger plot, because he was like texting, this looks bad. Stop it, dad. <laughs> and his dad didn't. He couldn't text his dad. He texted Mark Meadows. Anyway. Uh, well, let me, I mean, I hear a lot of people saying that. We don't know that he didn't text his dad. I'm sure he did text his good dad. Point. But, good point. But we don't know that. We don't have that record. And who knows what his dad said to him. You think that me. you think that Donald Trump gave his son his phone number? I think he gave him a burner phone. Yes. It's the Trump. Yes. It's the Don Jr. phone. It just blows up. All- <laughs> yeah. The please, fake, the fake phone number. Please love me, Daddy. Anyway, yeah, I interrupted you with that joke. Sorry. No, I just, I mean, who knows if Don texted his dad? I'm assuming he did, but if he thought the quickest way to get to his dad, who was presidenting and maybe not looking at his phone, <laughs> was was to go to Mark Meadows. I mean, I I don't want, I don't begrudge that. I know that's a fun, sticky little detail, but the the problem is. Despite all of these texts to Mark Meadows and Mark Meadows, if we believe him, saying that he was pressing hard for for Trump to stop it, he did not. He did none of it. That, I think, is the the, the most crucial right. part, whether yep. taking his son's advice or Sean's advice or anyone. He didn't take any of it. Right. He didn't take any of it. No, he was he was loving it. He wanted it to. Yeah. Uh, he was rooting for it. Um, yes. What about Democrats? You wrote a piece at the New York Daily News. Democrats have to learn how to win. They think selling their accomplishments will keep Congress in 2022. We could talk about their accomplishments, but, uh, you know, I think it's a great piece because I wish it were wrong. But politics is perception. What have you done for me lately? And I might not connect the dots between the thing that you improved in my life and you doing it. So what, what's your advice? Well, that last point is, the is, is I think, the most important one that. Democrats have done some stuff and they're big things, you know, passing, passing an infrastructure bill. But it's stuff that you might not personally feel for like years. So hanging your hat as a party on, you know, accomplishments, I I wish I wish that was all it would take. But I don't think that's smart. And while I, I never suggest, you know, 
parties play dirtier than they already do. Republicans are playing dirty. They're literally trying to stop people from voting. Yeah. And Democrats, I hear this all the time, this existential crisis in the party. Well, how do we how do we cut through, you know, the history of what will probably happen in 2022, which is that, you know, the the party out of party usually wins in the midterms. How do we cut through that? How do we sell our messaging? How do we compete with Republicans? Well, we just got to sell them on all the stuff we've done. And I want to slap people. I'm like, you are nuts. If you think that is going to get people to the polls, you have to make people scared because they should be of all the shit Republicans are going to do and are doing now. Didn't stop doing. That's going to undo your agenda. All the stuff you accomplished, which was really fun and cool. It's all going to be gone if they come in and take power back and they're going to stop more people from voting. I mean, uh, to me, it. They're, they are right to instill fear in voters. I don't like I don't like fear mongering for the sake of it. Right. But get comfortable with fear mongering because there's a lot of stuff to be afraid of that Democrats kind of don't want to talk about. They're like, well, you know, let's leave that over there and focus on us and what we've done. And like this isn't preschool. This isn't Montessori school. Get your hands dirty and win again or else. You know, Trump and his friends are going to take over the whole smash and dismantle d- democracy in a way they didn't get to the first time. Yeah. And that is a, a bigger concern, too. I want to ask you a few more about that, but I know I got to let you go. And I want to ask you one more question. You have been sharing uh, for, I guess, this summer is when you came out. Is that right? When you came out with. Yes, I'm gay. With your <laughs> your I, I hear you're in a deep relationship with comedian Judy Gold. Is that out yet? I adore her and I wish that were true. I know. I know. Everybody does uh, that <laughs> knows her. At least. So, no, no you can't. No, I did. I came out with my mental health struggle. With your mental health struggle and you being a well known public person, um, that, that makes it a lot more impactful. Uh, I, I've, I've uh, said a lot of things throughout my career as a comedian and, and a broadcaster, and, it's, and we've talked about this before. But the, the question I want to ask is when you do that, I'm sure you then get a flood of people who, who and we've I've asked you this before, but I want an update who you know can relate to you, uh, who, by the way, want to make you their therapist now. Oh, I had the same problem. What did you do? But my yeah. question is, you know, to not become more overwhelmed by complete uh, strangers who are really well-meaning and thoughtful. How much have you been able to help other people, you know, and also not being a therapist yourself? I, people are always asking me for advice. I'm like, listen, man, <laughs> I'm, I don't know. I don't want to give you the wrong thing. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I'm here to listen. How have you been handling like people, complete strangers, viewers, followers on social media, people who know your work and who have heard and read about how open you've been, their kind of uh, questions, their solicitations. How, how do you deal with it? I can't. I mean, I'll be honest. I can't think of a time where I really have been bothered by that or I haven't wanted to talk about it or I haven't wanted to hear great advice or questions. I mean, I'm real comfortable talking about it. It feels good for me to talk about it yeah. and hear from other people about it. I don't want to be a therapist and I don't want to just be giving people advice. And I'm real careful with the advice that I give, but it's cathartic for me to talk about it and not have to hide it or, or be ashamed of it. I'm not. And what's been so great is I hear from all kinds of people. I mean, in the wake of it, I heard from Naomi Osaka, who wanted oh, to talk did you tell me that? about oh, wow. mental health. And we worked on a piece together. And well, that was obviously that was great. But I also hear from friends and family and colleagues. Today, I was I sat down with a colleague. We were just going to have coffee. And it turned into a discussion of our mental health because this colleague had also been going through some mental health stuff and obviously didn't even hesitate to share the story because I had already shared mine. So it was immediately a safe space. We didn't have to like introduce the topic. Are you okay with this? Can we talk about this? Right. It was immediate. Like, let's talk about our mental health. You're giving them permission. A little jarring, but at the same time, this is what I'm doing it for. So that there's no stigma around it. So that in normal conversation, you and I could just be, 
you know, BSing and I can just drop into my therapist said, or I was talking to my therapist or I had a really bad day yesterday without it being an earth shattering, shattering revelation or something uncomfortable right. for me. So that's been really great. Uh, to see, and I'll let you know when I get tired of it. When I like want to stop talking right, about right, my right. mental health, I'm not there yet. For me, it still good. feels really helpful and good to do that. Great, great. Like, I know it can be overwhelming when when you put yourself out there. Sometimes, especially when you're very well known. I mean, it's a matter of literally without blowing smoke up anybody's ass. How many people know you and and have access to you the way we do to people on social media, uh, or at least think they do? So it's it, it can be tough, but. I'm so glad that you're continuing and talking about it everywhere. Uh, and I appreciate you always talking about it with me. You should be ashamed of one thing. That is the Al Gore picture that you have really confused a lot of people with without that story. <laughs> Essie Cup, thank you very much for joining me. As always. My pleasure. And thanks for letting me get that story off my chest. Yes, you got it. Well, how about it? S.E. Cup. You can watch her on CNN. You can follow her on Twitter and Instagram. And always appreciate when she joins me here on the show. I hope you like that and took something away from it. People want me to have folks on who I disagree with. S.E. and I disagree with uh, each other on a lot of things. I don't always necessarily even push back with her, like her comparison between Benghazi and the insurrection of January 6th. I mean, I thought those were not comparable, and I still don't know what bad thing the uh, Obama administration or Hillary Clinton did, what illegal thing they did over Benghazi. I really did never figure that out. Uh, that point she made about the, the videotape. I think they did think that videotape inflamed folks there. And why wouldn't they? It would make perfect sense. Anyway, it's the hard thing to pin down for the intelligence community. And many have written a lot about that and, and documented it. So I'd... Uh, I, but the point is, I didn't want I just didn't want to get wrapped up in that. I wanted to move to the next, not because I didn't want to have a conflict with SE. You've heard me have conflicts with her in the past. But sometimes you choose to move the conversation along to get a perspective on another thing. And you've heard it and you can decide what you want to do with it. So I don't know what do you think. I'd love to hear from you. As always, your thoughts on it. All right. Well, it is Monday. And that means we get to talk to Maura Quint, who is a brilliant analyst and activist and thinker and writer and humorist and a really good friend of mine. And now the show begins. Oh, and your bloody Mary's just not up to par. It's Maura Mondays. Yeah, here we are with Maura Quint, another very special Maura Mondays, the uh, Christmas week, your birthday week. <laughs> Thanks for saying it. I wasn't going to. I, I did it last time. It was too much. I was way over the top. I wasn't going to say it anymore. I put a post-it note on my camera. Don't forget. The and really upsetting thing. Sorry, I'm going to cut you off only to say some someone who follows me on Twitter, like that I do not know in real life, sent me a screenshot that my birthday was in their eye calendar. It was just like Mara Quinn's birthday. Like it auto populated in somehow. I have no idea why, but it was really upsetting. That can happen. That's interesting. That can happen. I've had things like that pop up. And my calendar that aren't in my life. They're somebody else's life. That's weird. But <laughs> yeah. that's also maybe they maybe they put it down. That's I mean, see, what I did, I put a reminder down because I didn't want to forget. I knew I was going to talk to you. So anyway, hmm. birthday that's week, birthday sweet. week, Christmas week. But you're Jewish. So but you're kind of like, what are you going to do? We're going to hang out with your kids Christmas Eve and do stuff. Um. So I, I have a kind of strange family. So not strange, but um, I, it's not super straightforward. My dad is Catholic. My mom is Jewish. So we were raised Jewish and I was raised with Hanukkah. But my dad's family is the the large family side. So like we would always go to aunts and uncles houses for Christmas. Um, and then now I'm, I'm divorced and um, my kid's dad is, is Christian. So they'll be with him for Christmas. Um, I was going to travel, but... <laughs> Omicron came and shut that all down. So I'm you, not sure what I'm doing now. So you can't. So you canceled your plans on account of Omicron, and I want to talk about that with you. Yeah, yeah because it's really. Uh, you had a tweet about this. You wrote celebrating the holidays again with our new tradition of last minute canceling everything. It's like the second year in a row that's happened, and you. You put it perfectly there, but I mean, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to think about it? Like, it feels like you want to blame somebody and it causes a lot of problems because maybe we're not on the same page. What are we supposed to do? 
Everybody wants to blame someone. I'm, I'm noticing that a lot more this time around. We were all just so tired of it. And I think we thought it was done. And yet here we are going through the same thing again. It's it's infuriating. And so now I think there's a lot more anger coupled with it this time around. Yeah, there's a lot more anger coupled with it, but it's it's causing a lot of problems for people because, you know, family members that have plans want to get together. Some, you know, someone reasonably says, I think we should still have a gathering. And someone also reasonably says, I don't think we should. Like, it's I can make an argument about we're all vac- vaccinated. We've all got the booster where you're even telling us we got to wear a mask. We'll wear, like all. And then some of I just don't feel safe. And you kind of got to be. Respect. I think you have to respect, especially the people who say, I don't feel safe. I, that's How do we morally fall down on these lines? Yeah, no, there's nothing else you can do. I mean, everybody has to make that decision for themselves, but also everyone's calculations are different. And even if you're there, your family or whatnot, they they could have other circumstances that they're maybe not disclosing to you that make them feel one way or another, especially people who are going a little bit um or who are making the choice to be as extra safe as possible. There's lots of reasons for that. The reasons can be, you know, physical. Maybe they have undisclosed ailments that they don't want to share, but they they make them vulnerable in some way. Or they interact with people who have vulnerabilities in their lives, and so they don't want to spread it. Or maybe they just have, you know, maybe that sort of thing actually, like, sets them in a mental, emotional, psychological loop of fear, and that emotionally isn't worth it. I mean, there's, like, lots of reasons for people to yeah want to yeah like uh, you know what i want to come but if i come i'm gonna be worried the whole time and who wants to be around that person who wants to be that person i'd rather not come and be and be less concerned and while that's not maybe my point of view i gotta respect it if if, if someone else feels that way i feel yeah or they might know like hey that's gonna i'm gonna be set off into being in this like hyper vigilant panic state for the next week or two and that's going to ruin all of the rest of the things that I need to do or get through. I mean, everybody, everybody's grappling with their own stuff. So, yeah, all we can do is just respect, respect one another. And then, of course, there's a new wrinkle in, in the virus and that it's an, a new variant. And so we still really don't quite know exactly about this variant. And now is not the time to be unsure of it. Like we know Delta was was devastating and continues to be. We don't know about this one. And so you kind of have to rework your arguments with your family. Be like, listen, I would have if, but now with this new variant, who knows? And they say sometimes, you know, they have got some things that are saying it's it's affecting kids more. My kids not uh, got all their vaccinations or whatever it might be. If your kids are really young, of course. So there's a lot of fair concerns when there's a new wrinkle is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to give people you know, excuse to, to justify whatever their concerns might be. Yeah, no, I just went through that just this past week because we were in a place like my kids are now vaccinated. I'm vaccinated. We were in a place where we were starting to like, you know, live life a little more pre pandemic normally, you know, not completely, but a little bit more. And my brother uh, came up from DC and we kind of, we shut everything down because we were planning to see people who were going to be vulnerable. So we wanted to be really isolated for a while. And my brother is like, you know, going out to, um, what's that place with all the video games and bowling and stuff, Dave and Buster's and, uh, you know, going to like, I mean, he's wearing a mask and stuff, but he's like going into these more populated places. And so then I didn't want to see my brother because, you know, he's now, he's taking a much, he's much more comfortable with the risk. He doesn't feel like he has any reason not to. So I had to distance myself from him, which, you know, was fine. He wasn't upset but, about but, but, it. But, you know, for two other people, it might not be fine. He might then this in another case be like, you know what? Oh, yeah. I, I resent you for being so cautious. I want to see you. You're my sister. And, you know, you could you couldn't blame people in a way for that because their intentions are I want to see you. I want to be with you. And yours are like, I want to, but I just you're you're, you're you keep going bowling. I mean, I you're mean, always the you're always big at Dave and Buster's and the bowling alley. And when else do you get to hurdle some large rock at uh, at things and knock it down like that? There is a, a tremendous amount of satisfaction in that. And I think we all need to hurl some large boulders. There really is. There really things. is. I yeah. never really thought about the, okay. satis- okay. the satisfaction of watching your bowling ball knock down a bunch of pins really is a, a metaphor for things. And I never, ever really <laughs> looked at it that way. And yet I, I did just bowl this past summer. All right. I want to play something for you. I kind of, I want to do this in order, just add a little extra layer of our conversations to get your reaction on a thing. I should have told you this before, but you'll have no problem with this. Maybe you've already seen it. This is the governor of Florida tripping on his dick. 
when he's on Fox Business Friendly Mia Maria Bartiromo's show and she asks him a question he's clearly not prepared to answer from her and he has to calculate, well, I won't say anything more. You can hear this, right? Governor, mm-hmm. yeah. we're not even sure what fully vaccinated means anymore. The other day, Dr. Fauci said, you know, we could be that uh, fully vaccinated means three shots, which is two shots for the vaccination and then one booster shot. Have you gotten the booster? So uh, I, I've done whatever I did, the, the normal shot. And, you know, that at the end of the day is people's individual decisions about what they want to do. But these boosters in terms now, Florida, we don't we ban vaccine passports. We, we won't let them fire you, even private businesses over this because we don't think that's appropriate. Governor. So, Mara. What do you think of his like non-answer? Like, why did he not want to answer whether or not he got the booster? There's no question that every single person who's been vaccinated knows exactly how many shots they've had. And certainly if you're a politician, you know. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's that's as good as a yes, I got the booster. If he hadn't gotten it, he'd be very excited to tell that. So, I mean, that's that's just sheer straightforward admission there. But I also just laugh every time. I love the shit that they're always this free market. You know, businesses should be allowed to do whatever they want. (laughs) They don't have to serve gay people. They don't have to let ladies in if they don't want to. Oh, but wait, (laughs) they're doing something we don't like. Nope, nope. Shut it down. We're going to make that yeah, it's a weird. It, it's a really weird thing when it comes to uh, safety m- measures. Yeah. You know, they're, they're telling they're telling the business they can't take the safety measures the business wants to take. So not even a government OSHA mandate. It's like, no, we as a business. Yeah, w- private wa- business. Want people to wear clothes when they come in. Mm-hmm. That's what we want. And they're saying you can't you can't have it. Yeah, no, as a business, I am making it mandatory that no one can come in my store and pee on the other customers. Nope, sorry. If they want to come in and pee on your other customers, that's just that you're going to have to let that happen. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really wild. But clearly the more Everyone's important peeing in Florida, I assume. Yeah. One another. <laughs> it's just that's how I picture Florida. But but I mean, just to be clear, he is giving an unanswer so that he doesn't lose politically from the anti-vax uh, folks. Because that's how big of a constituency they are. Now, he needs them to vote for him. So he's not going to be honest about whether or not he's gotten the booster. And, and, and I said this on Twitter, that directly leads to death because he's a leader and he's not leading. He's not telling the people what to, to do when he knows the answer and has done it himself. Is that too? Well, see, that's, that's, why he, uh, that's why he has to hesitate and hedge. You're right. He cannot lose any of their votes because they're dying off so quickly. You know, his margins are getting smaller. He's got to keep the ones that are there. If you make it through, you got to vote for me. You know, he can't have any reason not to show up at the polls. So it's a, it's a political calculation there. All right. So let me change gears from COVID and talk about the I'm not going to say more important issue because COVID is really important, especially what we're seeing happening across the country right now. And but I want to talk about uh, the death of Build Back Better, at least temporarily. I mean, I would love to to think that we can somehow revive at least parts of it. But Mara, this is basically your work. I mean, you are an advocate uh, to get legislation passed. You follow closely the inner workings of the United States Senate, the House, all the politics uh, nationally and locally when it comes to these issues, especially these issues, economic issues mostly. How would you describe kind of where the, the plan was in its latest iteration in terms of kind of you know, any of them, I mean, we, I'm sure you could talk, we could talk for hours about what it would do, but maybe some of the highlights that you saw in this bill, I think you saw. Um, yeah, I mean, there was some good stuff. Look, I'll back up and say that when we first started talking about, you know, Biden's agenda and Build Back Better, we were talking about a $3 trillion investment and Manchin just slash and burn that nearly in half uh, to what he would even begin to to vote for. And there were two possibilities, really, the way that the House did it, because he cut out how big the package could be. They could have either cut out a lot of the benefits. They could have just said, like, all right, well, we can't afford these programs, and so we're going to get rid of them. Or they could cut the amount of time that the programs would go for. And in a lot of places, they went with, like, all right, fine, we're still going to do these programs, but instead of doing them for 10 years now, we're going to do them for three years. Something like that. Which, no, and knowing that's smart, because when you give people yeah. something and they benefit from it, it's very hard to take it away from them. Yeah. I mean, you know, 
unless the GOP comes in power and then no problem. Just snatch it all away. It's it's well, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it with Obamacare. I mean, from babies. Yes, they couldn't do it with Obamacare. And there are certainly things that hopefully would stick around. And Manchin is playing that role anyway. Manchin is already saying like, oh, you intend this to be 10 years. So I don't actually even. So there's really no reason for me to get on board with any of this and just completely. He's just he's just rescinding any goodwill that he even pretended to have. Mm. Um, And I think that there's, it's interesting to watch because there is a lot of sort of like, well, we always knew that this was going to happen with him. And maybe that's true. I don't think that people who were, uh, had a little bit of hope in negotiating him were just with him were just sort of wrong outright. Um, I think it probably had to be tried, but it's incredibly frustrating. He's just such a piece of shit, frankly. <laughs> just an absolute piece of shit. Um, and uh, so, yeah, at this moment in time, it's it's dead. I mean, the White House says they're still going to fight for it. No, we'll he, see. He doesn't. I, what I called him uh, was more specific than a piece of shit, though I don't disagree. Which is like that he's not a serious person. Like he's a caricature no. of a of a guy who, of a politician who'd been bought and paid for. Like he's a he's like he's got the boat and he's got the Maserati and he's yeah. got he's got a lot of money and and he's not giving what his own people uh, want in in many cases and would uh, clearly benefit from and he's just a disingenuous you know bad faith actor who keeps moving the goalpost he's like like you couldn't script a bought and paid for disingenuous politician any better than this this guy in my opinion no absolutely I mean. You know, his daughter as well is uh, it is in her interest to keep drug prices uh, high. She, yeah. she profits from that. Like the family is really and coal. His, he's got coal investments that he says mm-hmm. are in a blind trust. But that doesn't make any difference about the regulations around coal They're there. I mean, come on. It's... No, no, it's it's all very much true. I think like the only reason I probably don't go the route of like, hey, he's just, uh, you know, bought and paid for is because I, I guess I just think so many of them are in so many different ways. So he kind of stands out um, as just sort of uniquely. Well, I, you know, that's, some. that's where we might part ways specifically both in the Senate and the house. Like I've interviewed so many of these people. I've, I've looked at where their money comes from. I've looked at what they say and what they do. And you could always say someone's compromised this way or that way, but that's the system that each politician has to work in. And I just feel like it's too cynical to say, that we can't have people doing good things in a broken and corrupt political system. I mean, Bernie Sanders, for for example, I think is it's hard to argue that that guy's bought and paid for Sheldon oh, White, yeah. Sheldon Whitehouse, and, and 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 many others, Elizabeth Warren, and many others. I would say in the Senate, hey, Maisie Hirono. I mean, you could name, uh, but and, and and I think they're consistent in what they say and what they do. And then in terms of you know who they get their money from, sometimes they're they're more lenient on this or that. But like. No, no, I agree. I'm certainly not writing off sort of all senators or all politicians. I just would also say I think it's more than just the ones that are really ostentatious about it. So it's mansion and it's cinema, but there are additional ones beyond that who um, who play ball more, who go along with it more, but who definitely um, are are not necessarily working from the truest or purest of motives. Um, but I'm not. No, I'm not trying to say that they all are. How about at the same time? Abolish the Senate. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree with with that, but it's too obviously simplistic. We Right now, this is the Senate that we have. And I hate the idea that we uh, denigrate grassroots organizing in a place like Georgia, like the, what they did in Georgia was nothing short of miraculous politically. And we wouldn't even have this without those senators. And there's a lot of amazing real people on the streets organizing now in my community as well. I'm a part of, and it's like, we've got to do that. We can't just say the system's broke and we're just going to let our kids and you know, the, the planet be eaten alive. Right? Like. You're not asking me that, are you? You're not, you're not bringing this to me and, and uh, in any way implying I would ever take a counter position to Organizing is incredibly important and matters, and we have to keep trying. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that people listening don't get embittered by the idea that mm. you know that the system is what it is because there's people doing great and amazing work all the time, including you and the organizations that you work with, and that's what I hate that they they discount the long hours and campaigns many of which you've worked on and led, uh, what they do and what they mean, even when they quote fail, much less. You know, they're always 
uh, have to be there as 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 fail safes. No, one of the like one of the driving principles or, or things that we have to keep in mind while organizing is that the winds are infrequent. Um, if you want to be involved in in making a difference, you need to accept the fact that you're going to lose more than you're going to win. And you're going to feel really devastated and defeated a lot regularly. And you have to kind of uh, determine and find ways to to get through that. And I don't think that that, though, is always just being like, well, nevertheless, we'll carry on. Like, yeah, sometimes that needs to be. But sometimes you need to sit and just be really, really angry and really sad and really despondent and despair. And sometimes you need that. You, you just you need to let that emotion out and let it exist with the knowledge that you're not going to stay there. You need to be in that place for a little bit until you are ready to get up and start fighting again. And that's OK, too. Um, I think I think there is a lot of frustration and anger and despair right now. But, you know, we're going to get up. And we're going to fight again. We're going to keep going. Well, I think that is uh, well said. And I, and I just want to make that also you could take that, I think, and make it completely personal. I was kind of thinking about how that also applies to life. Like the most e the easiest way to understand it is you, if you're trying to lose weight and you go on a diet and you lose 10 pounds and then you gain two. Like you don't give up. You say, oh, oh, set back. And I dealt with this more in terms of when I, after I lost my job and I would be like, I'm doing good, doing good. And then I would feel set back and I would start to spiral. And a good friend of mine gave me permission. And that's exactly what you're talking about in terms of activism. It's also true of, I think, your own trajectory and journey through life. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's important to allow yourself to feel feel whatever you're feeling. And, and sometimes you need to feel that for a while. And I mean, some people are really good at feeling their feelings. They don't need any encouragement. But like, <laughs> for me, I've had to sort of learn because I, I fight my feelings all the time. It's like just what I'm keyed up to do. I, I always kind of feel like, no, I should be I should be over here. Why am I here? I don't want to. And I try and like shut it down and move away from it. And that just it doesn't doesn't work very well, uh, historically. So I have definitely spent a lot of time learning to like, all right, sit with how I'm feeling, write it out, <laughs> you know, write down why I'm feeling this way. What's contributing to this? What do I need to experience or do or be thinking about to feel differently in the future and kind of give myself that sort of roadmap? Um, it, it has tended to help, but you know, life is a long journey of learning these things. Not easy. What do you, um, how much you write? You're a great writer. My favorite stuff that I've read of yours, and I'm sure there's a lot that you've done, maybe that's even better that I haven't read, but is your post debate wrap ups at McSweeney's. They're brilliant and hilarious. But do you write? Do you have any kind of writing practice, any kind of artist way, journaling, you know, articles, anything? I mean, like you're always writing in short, great bursts on on social media, on Twitter, especially. But when do you write? What makes you write? I'm actually looking back at this year in particular and. I'm kind of, I'm feeling personally um, bummed out <laughs> about how little I did creatively. I didn't really write this year hmm. almost at all. Um, and I'm frustrated by that. And I'm trying very hard not to like, not to do what I want to do, which is say, God, you suck. You had all this opportunity. You could have done X, Y, and Z. You didn't fucking do any of it. What the hell is it? Like, I want to beat myself up really badly. Um, and, and get really mad at myself, uh, for wasting time or wasting opportunities or being lazy or whatever the hell. And I'm trying very hard to be like, Hey, you're looking back at this year and you're feeling sad about your lack of creativity. So let's take that as a lesson. You're going to feel better about next year. If you do more creative things, let's try and like, how can you do that? How come, how can I set it up? So Right now, my my creative writing process is just trying to convince myself you're happier when you're writing things. You should mm. probably start doing that. That's that's as far as I am into that process at the moment. I'm sure that I do something similar in terms of uh, thinking about time and how I spend it. I think a lot about how I spend my time, but I, I don't know how much I think I have this weird, simple brain that like is kind of like a daily affirmation or something where I think that one thing I've gotten pretty good at is 
like putting putting today away. I think I think like life is like Groundhog Day. Like when I wake <laughs> up tomorrow, I'm like I have another opportunity to do all of the things that I want to do that I need to do today. Uh, today's an opportunity to reach out to this person and tell them, the, you know, what all of the list. Today's a new day, and then. When, when that day feels wasted or I get really frustrated that I lost an hour here or this bad thing happened, I'm pretty sure I, I do tell myself and go tomorrow when I go get them, like some silly thing like that. I think I do that. Is that, is what that, the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> what is this? What is this beaming optimism and like positivity towards the world? It's incredible. Well, uh, I don't know if it is. I don't know if it, I, I'm not sure it's, it is that I think it's just my, my mechanics. I think I have to, but that's a good mechanic to have. That's the sort of thing I'm like, try to learn. I mean, to the point where like my therapist will be like, you need to look in the mirror and tell yourself all the opportunity you haven't like, like I'm trying to force it. And you're just like, I don't know. It just comes naturally. This is just what I do. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't come naturally. It comes from like some probably self help and, and, and a poem or two. Um, there's a, I mean, I get moved by by like sayings, by quotes and shit like that. That's what I'm trying to talk about. But there's a an Emerson poem about like forgetting, you know, what happened yesterday. I used to have it up on the wall here and I thought I had it memorized. But it's this idea of letting go of yesterday and, you know, tomorrow's a new day and I got to find it. I will also say, though, I'm. I've always been like a a quote geek, basically. I, I used to like keep a book and I would write down anytime I heard a quote that I really liked, which was probably like just sort of early Twitter, really. Just these short little snippets of things from various people lined up in a row. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I now have you said you had that on your wall before. I'm just staring up. I'm sitting on my floor on my bedroom floor right now. And I have I have two quotes up on my wall at the moment. So. Oh, really? I want to know what they are if you don't mind sharing, but, um, but let me, I found it. Here it is. Emerson. Write it in your heart that every day is the best day in the year. He is rich who owns the day and no one owns the day who allows it to be invaded with fret and anxiety. Finish every day and be done with it. I love that. You have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new new day. Begin it well and serenely with too high a spirit to be cumbered by your old nonsense. This new day is too dear with its hopes and invitations to waste a moment on yesterday's. Now, that's flawed. I'm crying, though. Oh, good. <laughs> How much I get. Oh, good. But I mean, it's no, it, I it, it, it's flawed because I think it it dismisses to some extent like real horrible shit that didn't go away. Your addiction didn't oh, yeah. go away yesterday. You you know, your pain, your loss didn't go away because the because you went to bed. So I think it's it could be there's some nuance. My wife has been critical of that for that reason. I think it's fair, totally fair. But I still kind of live by that. No, I don't. To me, I don't. Maybe, I you know, I, like I said, I was kind of emotionally moved. So maybe I didn't. Um, listen as carefully as I ought to once I started feeling <laughs> an emotion about it. But I, I didn't hear it like that necessarily anyway, because I don't, I don't hear life like that. Like, okay, your addiction is still there tomorrow. Yes, of course it is. Are you trying to completely be done with your addiction tomorrow? You probably aren't. You're trying to be a bit better. You're trying to do something. You're trying right. to make one step towards something. You know, I'm not expecting tomorrow I will have written the novel I want to write. But gosh, if I could just write a couple sentences, <laughs> like that would be better than what I did today. Um, and I think that's what I sort of hearing. Um, anyway, What's I don't know. Good. I, I'm going to I'll put that in the show notes for people and uh, people want to read it. What are you, can you share yours? What you got? I love by the way, I love that you like I, I'm a sucker for like surrounding myself with mantras and quotes that I can, I can read. And I, I've always done that. I even used to write my goals and post them up on the wall so I could see them. Like when I can, I have dry erase boards, when I can see stuff, it helps my mind. But what do you got? Well, actually I have downstairs um, where I can see it. This is very, but it's just this little ceramic tile um, that says rest, you beautiful, busy idiot which I just like seeing all the time. It's like very helpful to me because I always feel like I have to be occupied 
Um, so anyway, that's downstairs. I love but, that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right now, the ones I'm looking at that are on my wall, um, the, the first is Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Um, I have that one up there because, man, it's really easy to doubt that. And it's nice to hear it. And then uh, the other is the uh, Nelson Mandela quote. It always seems impossible until it is done, which is another one that I just like to be reminded of every day. Because, uh, yeah, <laughs> it seems impossible. And I, I myself am someone who often looks at things and says, there's no way. Um, did they ever work did, when you say that will you, what, did, can you say what usually happens or you, what are we looking at personal or, or political or like larger goals I don't know what you mean when, when you look at a thing and say no way I'm not sure exactly what thing you're looking at is on oh the, the it always seems impossible until it is done um, is something that it it tends to help me with my work I think because I think then I, I you know, I'm I'm constantly up against impossible tasks at work. Right. Changing the world is an impossible task. Right. But I don't know. People have done it over and over and over again. So clearly we can as well. Um, and then I have one more quote that I Ooh. use all the time, too, if you want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not staring at it. So I, I think I've memorized it. It's not difficult. But it's Arthur Ashe's, um, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. That is probably my favorite quote of all time. And that is the one I return to the most because the other thing I, the challenge that I am up against often with myself is feeling like, well, what you would really need to do if you really wanted to do this is you'd need all this money and all this time and all these people. And it would have to be, you know, and then I don't have any of that. So I can't do anything. Uh, and mm. so that's, I go to that one a lot that it just start where you are <laughs> Look around use, you. What do you have? What, use what you have and do what you can. And that might not be everything, but it will have been something. And that matters to me. I love, I love all those quotes. It's also interesting that uh, not one of these quotes is from a white man. <laughs> Didn't occur to me. <laughs> just, uh, I, well, I, I'm right. I have the names. Margaret I'm Mead. just really woke. Pete, okay. Margaret Mead, yeah. Nelson Mandela, Arthur Ashe. I just wrote them down. And I was that like, that's funny, actually. No, I, I didn't like, even oh, look at that. Not occur to me. Huh. Well, my only one was from the whitest of men, <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson. Who there's some, he actually invent, invented whiteness. I'm pretty he sure he actually did. He well, he yeah. um he would uh, climb birch trees only because they were so white. <laughs> I believe it's Emerson who would in in a wind storm he would climb to the top of of a tree and he would basically surf on it like the tree would sway and he would be at the tip and like during a windstorm he would climb all the way to the top of a tree and and basically ride it. That sounds apocryphal. I don't believe that. Maybe you're right, but I, I don't know. But I, I mean, it's it's a fun vision, but I see it more for like Winnie the Pooh or something. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's an easy, <laughs> it's definitely an easy thing to say you did last night. You'll That's never fair. believe, you'll never believe what I did. Climbed up to the top of the tree and rode it like a surfboard. I don't think Waldo did that. <laughs> I was talking about climbing and riding trees. He was sitting by the fire writing poetry, if you ask me. Look, life was boring back then. You know, you had to invent your own fun. Seriously. Yes. I mean, I'd be climbing trees, too, if I didn't have my phone. Yes. The phone. Do you ever look at your 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 kids? I keep trying to correct our peers and, uh, who are so judgmental of our kids. You're always in front of the phone. I'm always like, just a reminder, you would have been, too. If you had this amazing thing with all of this connectivity to all of your friends in the world, you would have been around that. We, you wouldn't have been running around outside and doing all the things we did because of how amazing that, compu that that the phone is. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I wouldn't have been running around outside if I wasn't kicked out anyway. Like, I just wanted to read. So, I mean, I do think that you do have to, like, you know, sometimes we just want to sort of sit in our cozy places and, and do what we want to do. And it can be good to kick kids outside a little bit, too. Or grownups, for that matter. I don't mean to. Oh, I'm no, I'm saying. I, I want someone to kick me outside in general. But, yes, Don't absolutely. get me wrong. Tear the phone out of their hands and kick them outside. Don't get me wrong. It's this idea that you're casting judgment on your kid. What's wrong with you? Nothing. It's a fucking... No, no supercomputer in there <laughs> no absolutely and the other thing too is i mean it's it's connectivity to other humans like it's not necessarily yeah. it can be very isolating sure. and solitary depending on how you're using it but for the most part it's actually very social and and there's a lot of interpersonal stuff happening uh through this little magic box so yeah there's like 500 different ways to find out how much happier everybody else is than you 
it's wonderful. You have that instant depression in your hand. I mean, like you used to have to go searching for that depression, man. Now we just do just beam it right to you. Do you feel like the worst people are the people who only share their social media photos from their happiest moments, including and in mainly like their tropical vacations? I feel like there are some people that that's all we get. And like, come on, give me some bullshit. Give me some nonsense. You're not living life on a beach. You work. Yeah. In, you work in a cubicle. That doesn't bother me because, I mean, people use their social media in different ways. Some are using it really specifically for others. Others are just using it as their own little like, oh, this is where I put my photos that I want to, you know, remember or have. And other people, yeah, they want to project a certain person that they maybe yeah, vehemently are disagree. <laughs> I, I, if you're going to post like five photos of vacations with you and your beautiful family, the sixth photo should be of you crying. <laughs> I, that would be an interesting, you need to start a platform because then you can put that right into the user notes right there. Like for every, every time that I get annoyed at my jealousy of your life, I need to see that you yes. had diarrhea yesterday, basically, <laughs> and like couldn't move off the toilet. Like I, that's what I need to know. Yes. Yeah. For every six photo, I want you to get your kidney stone <laughs> facial expression. Yeah. I want to see a letter of rejection. I want to see. I someone... think I've gotten. Cutting you off, whatever. I might be being a disingenuous. I think I've gotten a, a better, a much better handle on the idea of of FOMO, for, for sure. Like, I really think I'm pretty, like, stable with my kind of mindset and my work and my life. But I feel like I've gotten better. It's, it was, you know, horrible when I first started as a comic. Uh, mm. I used to go on websites and see who was performing where. That's where it really began for me. And then, you know, all of the normal stuff with anybody having whatever they have and doing whatever they do. But... I think it's re that it's it's easier for adults to get a better understanding of that. But I think kids like my daughter at the end of the summer, she's like, I had the most boring summer. Everybody had a better summer than me. I'm like, what? You had an amazing summer by every possible measure. And you must be thinking of just of what you've seen on social media with people doing things that, like, come on. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, obviously, I think there's a lot of research being done on how social media negatively affects sort of young minds from yeah. that particular perspective. So definitely, I think that's there. But I also think like, I, I think that there's, you know, that existed pre social media, too, because sure. you only heard about the cool things that people did. They weren't talking to you about like the, you know, the shitty times that they had. So I mean, like, it, it was there to some degree, too. And we all have to like learn what to do with jealousy. You know, what, what do we do with that feeling of insecurity or that, you know, others have stuff a lot better. I don't know. I think everyone has to kind of grapple with that. So another good goddamn answer or thought. So <laughs> your birthday, your birthday is Friday. Any birthday? Is it? Uh, oh, the, no. Isn't it the 24th? Oh yeah. Is that Friday? Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, any traditions for you? Is there anything we can do? Uh, no. I mean, my birthday really, I, I gave it up. It, it really is Christmas Eve. I, I sort of jokingly make a thing of it now, but no, there, I have no traditions. None. I got nothing for my birthday. Like nothing that is consistent. I Except, wish for I wish for you to write a journal entry. You know what? I might try and do that. Maybe I'll try and write something funny. Maybe I can be funny again. Do you have faith in me? Do you believe in me? Do you think I can be funny again? I think you, anybody, you, I, think, I think everybody does. It's just a matter. I, I Like you're, it's always annoyed me about you, how funny you are about so many different things very quickly. And it's kind of annoying if somebody isn't necessarily practicing that. So if you're asking me, <laughs> like if you're not actively, you know, working on, you know, a, 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 tw a tweet, much less, you know, an essay or any other kind of humor, I'm like, oh man. Well, I'm really wasting that muscle because I'm over here fucking spinning my wheels for a decent tweet, much less joke, taking me hours and still not getting to where you got within a minute. So, yeah, frustrates yeah, me. Yeah, I was a little annoyed, actually, at the entire idea that you just said of working on a tweet. I'm like, what's working on a tweet? This is just like what I exactly out at any given moment. I and rest. Then I rest my case. <laughs> Half the time I just go, oh, don't post that. But then every so often I'm like, go ahead. You can post it. It's all right. Well, why don't you just start then writing some of my tweets, for God's sake? <laughs> punch my shit up if if you're looking for for uh some shit that you can't or don't want to say eh, send it to your old friend pete for some reason the idea of uh being creative and being funny i feel like uh invisibly being funny to boost a, a, another 
comic white man, maybe it's like maybe it wouldn't give me the same satisfaction as doing something myself. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, I'm, and let me be clear. I will pay you good. <laughs> I'm not expecting you to feel purpose driven. I see. Well, hey, you know, it is weird. I, scream, baby. Cash rules everything around. Me. I've Let's never been able to, like, produce for another person. I can't, you know. No? That, no. And I, I feel I, like I've done a lot of that. I think so. it's hard to do. My producers that I never worked with any producers who even wanted to, like, produce for me. I begged them and tried to pay them to to write and to do extra stuff. And they just... It's a hard thing for people to do, I think. Uh, but obviously, a lot of people do it really well. They, you know, are awesome at writing jokes for other people's voices. But I've never been much good at it. I mean, I've never been specifically just that. But I have definitely... I've definitely written for other people. I mean, like, my first... Uh, one of my earlier earliest relationships when I was, you know, late teens or early 20s uh, was with someone who was a stand-up comic. And I didn't really know it at the time that I was writing his jokes, but I, was, I only know now that I was like writing his jokes. But in my mind, we were just like kind of joking around. And then the jokes that I said would end up in his stand-up set. Um, That's, uh, he never should have ended that relationship. I'm sure you only made him better. Oh, I ended the relationship. That, that was That was all me. Oh, I, I, did I say he never should have ended that relationship? Uh, you did. Yeah. 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 His fault. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just assumed that he must have somehow wanted to shoot himself in the foot, but weird to date yeah, a comedian. That's usually me. I like to wield the gun in these things. <laughs> it's weird to date a comedian. Dating a comedian is, uh, is a bizarre thing. Sometimes yeah. two comedians date each other because of the like, yeah. I was going to say, have you dated another comedian? No, but I know, no, never. But I know a lot of comedians who date each other and I know a lot of comedians, you know, I know like there's like a support group for spouses of comedians. Really? To some extent, like they get, like my wife is like her best friend is Joe Matarese's wife. And like there's yeah, there's a lot of similar shit there, especially for people who aren't necessarily like your complete or your complete opposite. They would never want to be on stage and try to make people laugh, you know? Right. But, which but, is probably the best type of person to be with a comedian, someone who's I don't just know. Like, or or two comedians. I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of comedians, Rich Voss and Bonnie McFarlane, Al Ducharme and and um, Bernadette Pauly, like just and many more that are. Uh, I don't know. They probably support the hell. That's what I'm thinking. Like when you're dating this guy because you're really funny, like you supported his comedy. It can be, you know, there's no judgment. But I mean, I would. The idea of having somebody like constantly giving you ideas for bits is great, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, I actually that that was not. Uh, the reason that I ended the relationship was completely separate from that. I, I actually really enjoyed that. The only sort of thing looking back is that it never occurred to me that I could do it myself. Like I just always felt like the, the girlfriend who was kind of, you know, who was funny, but it didn't occur to me that I could be putting out any of these jokes in any format. Well, it's probably one of the primary reasons why you have a massive Twitter following without other huge amount of exposure. I mean, it's that they just love taxes, Pete. They just love taxes. Well, yeah, but you're, <laughs> you're not only <laughs> tweeting about tax. Nothing but tax. Come on. You're, I mean, your last six tweets had to do with uh, tangentially the holidays, I think. Come on. Yeah, no, that's true. I could not really say anything about any of this stuff. You have a lot of, I tried to, to have a tweet lot of, about it. I was like, Ooh, this is too angry. I feel like you have a lot of holiday COVID material. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is great because, you know, performing in front of large groups of people seems like a, a real natural thing to do right now. Oh, so, boy. you know, a lot, of, a lot of places for me to put that material. All right, I, I don't took know why you, I'm doing weird voices today. I'm sorry. I took you way too long. I know you have uh, a meal uh, waiting. Thank you so much for talking to me. As always, it's so great to kick off our week with you. We went all, uh, as we often do, like in a lot of different places, which I love. And it feels good to have these conversations and people love when we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode of Stand Up. Thank you for your support and subscription. Go to StandUpWithPete.com if you haven't signed up for a paid subscription. Welcome to all of the new subscribers that joined up last week. Can we get some new folks this week, Christmas week, can we? Christmas present to me and really to yourself because we learn together each and every day here on this daily program. All right. Well, have a great day. Check in with yourself and let me know how it's going and write a review of the podcast. And that's all I've got for you. Thank you to my guests, Maura Quint and S.E. Cup. Thank you, as always, to Pete Coe and John Carroll, who sings us out each and every day. And it was great to see at our Friday night hangout as well. Great to see Johnny and funny and brilliant and talented as he always is. Take it away, John. Stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all they had.
to stand up. They had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right. Experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show a to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 